Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> today's title is uh, Walking into the Lion's Den. Um, and if you look up what this means, walking into the lion's den, um, it's basically to enter into a situation that puts you in great danger. Um, but of course, the, the origin of this phrase comes from Daniel in the Bible. And the story goes that there's a time when the other governors are really jealous of Daniel because he's receiving so much favor from the king. So they devise a plot, and they convince the king to issue a decree. And the decree goes that if anyone prays to any god or any human other than the king, that person will be thrown into the lion's den. And I just want to read you Daniel's response to this. It's in Daniel 6.10. It says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, so Daniel, he knew this decree had been published. Right? He knew what was going to happen if he goes against it. So now, when Daniel learned that the decree, decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he prayed. He got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So Daniel, knowing death was waiting for him, if he did this, he still obeyed God and prayed. He willingly walked into the lion's den. He knew the consequences, and he still went through with it. And he wasn't alone in kind of doing this kind of thing. His friends were the same way. For his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a decree also had been ordered during that time that everyone had to bow down to a gold statue of the king. And for those that didn't, they would face death. But what is their response to the same situation? It says in Daniel 3.17, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They resolved to walk into the furnace if they must. It says in verse 18, but even if he does not, so they knew there's a chance that God might not rescue him. They were just doing it in faith. You know, today's passage is the same situation for Paul. He is told of what's going to happen if he goes to Jerusalem. He is warned by the Spirit. If you go to Jerusalem, you're going to face persecution, maybe even death. But he still goes. He still walks into the lion's den. You know, how does he do this? How is he able to do this? You know, does he not have fear? Does he not worry about what's going to happen? You know, is he crazy? Is he a superhuman? I want you to think about yourself. If you were faced with this situation, would you do the same thing? You know, in the Bible it says that in the future things are going to get more difficult for us. Your times will be worse. And the culture and society, they're following a flow. It's the flow of the ruler of the kingdom of air, which is Satan. Are you willing to stand against it? You know, are you willing to, are you going to follow this flow that the world set out? You know, be on the safe side. Or are you going to stand on the side of God and his word? And it's easy to say that we'll, we'll follow God to the ends of the earth, you know, that we'd sacrifice our lives for him. You know, all these things are easy just to say. But really, to have the conviction to be able to do it is another thing. You know, what if the costs are high for you? You know, what if following Christ means that you've got to give up your friends, your family, the respect of your peers or coworkers? You know, for the early church, this is something that they risked every day. They risked their lives. You know, in the past, we've talked about, you know, praising and persecution. But a lot of times, that was when you weren't able to have a choice of the situation. When the persecution came to you without any say or any action of your own. But this situation is a little different because Paul, he's warned. You know, Paul is given the option. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You know, all the disciples, all the believers that are there with him, they plead with him, don't go. But he still does. 
What does he see? What does he know? What does he have that the others don't? The first thing that I think he has is that I think he's able to see eternity as more valuable than today. You know, the culture of this world that we live in, it's always about living for today. And not just living for today, but actually living for the moment. <laughs> you know, we have phrases like YOLO, you know, you only live once. And carpe diem, you know, seize the day. You know, YOLO is basically just the new version of carpe diem. <laughs> but the, so the, the point is always the same, right? Is live for the now, live for today. Live in this moment because you're going to reach a point when you're going to be old. Or, you know, you won't be able to do these things. You know, there's going to be a point when you die. We all die. So risk it all. Do what you want. You know, do what you desire. Do what feels good. Live a little. You know, don't worry. Don't think about the consequences at all. Just do it. That's the proclamation that they have. And of course, you know, our society, we like this kind of thing at first. You know, get out of the routine that you have, the boring life, the mundane. Kind of have a little excitement in your life. Challenge a little bit. So this really took roots in people's lives, and they, they started you know, living this way. But then some people started to kind of wake up a little bit. I'd say it was kind of the more mature audience. They realized something that the younger generation really didn't. You know, if you look at like, a lot of the social media sites, you know, they have all these, all these young people that have YOLO written all over. You know, it's tattooed on them. It's everywhere. And then they have these crazy pictures with it. But then you also see all these pictures that are mocking them. They have things like, it'll be a tragic car accident. And on the license plate, it'll say YOLO. Or a picture of teen pregnancy that says YOLO. It's basically saying that you know, people that are living this way, it's irresponsible. And it's kind of dumb, actually. You know, there are serious consequences to people that are living this way. You know, but basically this had seized America, you know, taking huge risks, living for the moment, not thinking about the consequences, gambling away your savings, risking your life for some fun, falling headfirst into every pleasure that you can. These all have consequences in the end. And ultimately, even though you're hoping to achieve happiness through these things, you don't. It's always temporary, it's not lasting. And it's not true happiness that you gain. You know, living for the moment means quit that boring job. Go explore the world. Go travel. In a way, it can be good. But it's also saying avoid struggle. Avoid hardship. Avoid responsibility. Avoid commitment. Avoid anything that is difficult that you don't like. Do what you want. Don't take the time to struggle to learn something. Just seize the excitement of the moment. Um, you know, there's a famous proverb. It's not a proverb from the Bible, of course. But there's a famous proverb that I'm sure you all know. Um, it goes, give a man a fish, and he will eat for, a, eat day. for a day. Teach a man to fish, and he will eat for, a lifetime. eat for a lifetime, right? You know, living for the moment, it puts you in category one. <laughs> You're granted the fish without working for it or earning it or learning. And the suffering always comes later. Does getting what you want, when you want it, bring true happiness? I would say that it doesn't. There's a story I read this week in the New York Times. The title of it is called, Love People, Not Pleasure. And the story it starts out by talking about a ruler in 10th century Spain. And this ruler, he lived in complete luxury. He had everything that he could have wanted. He ruled for over 50 years. He ruled in victory and peace. He was beloved by all of his subjects, dreaded by his enemies. He had respect from his allies. He had riches and honor, power and pleasure. All were within his call. He had all of these earthly blessings. It's almost the same story as Solomon. You know, all these things seem great. Fame, riches, pleasure beyond imagination. But he made a conclusion after the 50 years. He said this, I have diligently numbered the days of pure and genuine happiness, which have fallen to my lot. They amount to 14. 
So out of the 50 years of living in pleasure, in fame, in popularity, there's only 14 days that he had true happiness. You know, the idea of, of living for all that we can gain, living to gain all of our wants and all of our pleasures, living for the moment, you know, it seems great, but there are real life consequences to these things. And some of them cost you your life. And some of them can affect you the rest of your life. I had a friend in college. I don't think he's listening to this message. I'll just say his name. His name's Nevada. Kind of like that name. It's cool. It's kind of like Dakota. It's another state. <laughs> Nevada, um, but I had this friend called Nevada. And we lived on the same floor freshman year. And he was one of those guys that freshman year, he just went all out. You know, living for the moment. He loved it. You know, doing as much as he can, partying as much as he can. Um, and he loved it, but it didn't really hit him until the end of that year, when he failed out of college. But luckily, he was able to go on probation. And so for the rest of his college career, actually the first semester he failed out, so actually for the rest of his college career, he spent that time working really hard. He was very diligent. And he actually earned almost all A's all the time. But the problem is, even though he earned all these A's, because he failed out the first year, his GPA was so bad that first year, if you add that up, the cumulative score is still terrible. <laughs> he never was able to raise it up to a decent grade, even though he worked so hard. And it's because of that one mistake he made his freshman year semester. You know, of course, there are other situations that are worse than this. You know, drunk driving accidents, you know, teen pregnancy, things like that. Uh, you know, living today, it can give you courage to do something that you need to do. A lot of people, you know, when they think of carpe diem, it's always about asking out a girl <laughs> or asking about a guy that you like. You know, it's really challenging yourself, risking something. But, you know, these things are only good, this courage is only good if you know what you're living for. If you're living just for today, just to give that, just to get that adrenaline boost, to get that excitement, to fulfill your selfish desires, and that's what's keeping you going, there's something wrong there. But if you're living for today, and that means you're challenging in faith, overcoming yourself, overcoming your scars in Christ, not being limited, but living an abundant life in Christ, you have purpose and you have a clear understanding of your freedom in Christ. Living for the moment then becomes living the way you were meant to. And that's living for eternity. Now I was comparing how one day is compared to the rest of your life. But what about this life compared to the eternity that we're going to live? You know, most people want to spray the one day they have out to this, this lifetime, and they think that's all there is. You know, this is their lot in life. That's all there is. There's nothing beyond it. But the truth is, there is an absolute reality after death. There is an afterlife. And at that time, there is going to be a judgment. We often talk about the judgment regarding our sin. Those that have Christ are free from their sins, and they're going to receive an eternal inheritance, inheritance of eternal life at that time. They are going to enter into heaven, whereas those that don't, their judgment will be to face hell. But we are justified in Christ. But there is also another judgment, actually. Rewards based on your life, how you were a steward of what God has entrusted you with. We don't talk about this much, but this is in the Bible. If you look at the parable of the talents, or minas, individuals are entrusted with a certain amount of money, and they are judged on how they were stewards of it. You know, even Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's all about would you rather live a luxurious life now, in this moment, in this lifetime, or for an eternity? I think Paul, when faced with this conflict of going to Jerusalem, 
was able to see beyond today. He had a vision not just for this life, but for eternity. And these are the eyes that we need, eyes to see beyond the future to the eternal life. When faced with a world that is fallen, when things get worse in the future, and you're first with persecution, really have these eyes to see eternity. But this isn't just for you and the blessings that are in store for you. We also need to look at something else. We also need to look at the fate of those that are around us. Hell is a destination that others will face. Paul saw this. He saw their future. He saw that other people without a relationship with God are destined to this. What they need is Christ. And that's why even if it meant death for him to go to Jerusalem, he must go. And he went. Um, there's a movie I saw a few years back. I actually read the book uh, before. But it's called End of the Spear. I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen it. And the Spirit's about some missionaries that go to South America. And they're trying to reach this tribe there, this native tribe. Um, and it's kind of a, dis a very um, uh, difficult situation. I mean, they're risking their lives and going there, of course. Um, and so it's a scary situation. But you know, there's a situation, there's a time in the movie when you know, the father that's a missionary, he's talking to his son. And his son is really worried about him, you know, if he's going to get killed if he goes to the field there. Um, and so his son asks him, you know, if the natives attack you, are you going to fight back? You know, they carry these guns with them for protection. And he says, if they attack you, are you going to use the guns that you have to protect yourself? And I think it's important to understand the father's reply to this. Because the father replies that no. He won't. Because he knows where he and his friends are going. He knows that they're going to go to heaven. But that's not where these natives will go if they're killed. If they die in their sins not knowing Christ, there's one destination for them. And if you know the story of how this plays out, they actually go to the natives and they actually are killed. All of them all of these husbands, all of these fathers. But what's amazing is what comes after. Though they all died, what happens later is their wives and their children, they enter into this community. They just march right into this tribe, and they live with those natives. And the amazing thing that happens is this whole tribe, this whole community, they end up becoming Christian. They're saved. It's an amazing thing. So my question today is, do you have the eyes to see? To let go of yourself, to think about the eternal lives, and really transcend yourself. The next thing that I want to talk about is the choice that Paul has given. He's given this choice. You know, he's warned of what's going to happen. He's warned about the persecution that he's going to face. You know, the believers are urging him not to go. Don't go, don't go. They plead with him, crying over him. And it's actually hard for Paul. You know, it says it's heartbreaking for him. But as Christians, we are free as well. We have a free will and are not slaves to Satan. We can make choices regarding our lives of what to do and what not to do. And don't take this for granted. You know, we can always choose the safe route of going with things, going with the world. Or we can choose to be led by the Spirit. I want to look at the story of Esther. The story of Esther the book of Esther, uh, the setting is that the Jews, they're at risk of peril. They're facing death. And a situation um, that was arranged by one of the officials of the king. So Mordecai, he comes to Esther to petition her to speak to the king about the situation. And this is what Esther says in response. She says, all the king's officials, this is in Esther 4, uh, verses 11 to 16, it says, all of the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. 
When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. And I think this is important to remember. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, before you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So this is the resolve that Esther has. And it's amazing to note that God is sovereign over all things. We know that. And if we don't do something, God is going to arrange for something to work out, so it does. God's plan is always carried out. But the thing is, are you going to be a part of that plan or not? You'd always choose a safe route, something that might seem better. But if you choose to be led by God's Spirit and follow His way, you're blessed. And in this situation, it says, who knows, but you erase this position for this very reason. So ask yourself, what is the reason you're in the workplace that you are at, in the position you are in, in the school you are at, with the friends that you have, with the family that you have? Why has God placed you in that place? I believe it's absolutely to bless those that are around you. For Esther, she, she had this resolve. She said, if I perish, I perish. She walked right into this line then. We have these choices that we make regarding what we've received, regarding what God has entrusted to us, regarding our lives. And I don't want to say this to burden you in any way, but just really enjoy the fellowship with God and be led by the Spirit. Know God has a plan, and you can choose to be a part of it. And the things that I talked about first, a lot of these things are related to your future and what's going to happen. But what is the source of this conviction and this resolve that these people have? What was Paul holding on to? What allowed him to challenge? What allows us to challenge the world when we're faced with a similar situation? I think the thing that we need to realize, that Paul realized, was that he valued something more than anything else. He knew the value of what he had. The first thing that he realized was his new life in Christ. He realized what he was saved from. He was saved from being spiritually dead, from being a slave to Satan, from even being a child of the devil. He was saved from his destiny of going to hell. You know, people living only for the moment, they're simply baited by Satan. It's like a carrot put in front of a horse, just leading it astray. That's all he does. And it's ultimately to lead you to a point of destruction for your lives and your eternal life, in fact. But Paul, he gained a new life in Christ. He gained forgiveness of sins, and he became a child of God, as do we in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, You are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. This is the life that Paul knew that he had. He also realized what he had gained, this treasure that is unseen to the eyes. We absolutely need to know the value of the spiritual blessings and the spiritual things. In Matthew 16, 26, it says, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? It's something that we do not see, but is of the utmost value. You know, Jacob knew this value. Esau did not. In Genesis 25, it says that once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was, he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stew, for I am exhausted. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is my birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Now there was a spiritual thing behind this birthright, and he just gave it up. It was something that was invisible. It wasn't tangible. He saw the thing in front of him. He just wanted to be hungry. 
right? He just wanted to be satisfied of his hunger. He wanted something to fill his stomach. And for that short, brief moment of happiness, he gave over something that is of utmost value to him. Now, Jesus also talks about this treasure. It's worth, you know, anything that you can possess in this world. Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then his joy, and in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought the field. And what did he give up to gain this treasure? He sold everything that he had. He realized this treasure was worth more than anything else. That is the value of the kingdom of God. And Paul, too, knew of this treasure. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 12. And actually, this is a passage we went through last week at the main service, and also um, today. It says, starting in verse 7, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God, and not from us. It's a treasure that we have. We are hard-pressed on every side, we're not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You know, we have this treasure, and we are going to face persecution. But this treasure is worth everything. It says in verse 10, we, also care, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Every day we carry around the death and life of Jesus Christ. And the death, being dead to our sins. The death of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. We have that. But at the same time, we also carry around with us the resurrected Christ. That is the spirit that is leading us today. In verse 16 it says, Therefore do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Now this was today's message that we heard. For our light and momentary troubles we are achieving for us an eternal glory that far away is them all. So fix your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Fix your eyes on these unseen things. These inner things, the spiritual things. Fix your eyes on that. Um, just lastly, in conclusion, you know, some of us, we don't have these eyes to see eternity. We don't know God's plan in every situation. We don't know the treasure and the value of what we have. But pray to discover these things. Seek these things out. You know, for some, to bring you to a point where you've met with Christ, you may have gone through a very difficult journey, given up much. But you know that what you've gained is worth it all. Knowing that we have a difficult future ahead of us and still walking that path, it's going to take courage. It's going to take faith. It's going to take hope. You know, we need courage to face the fear that we all have. We can't help it but be afraid at times. But courage is transcending that fear. It's going beyond it. And faith, to really trust in God's plan. God is sovereign over all things. Trust Him. Trust that He is good, that He is a good God. And hope. And our hope is always in these spiritual things, in the eternal life that's going to follow. You know, God has granted us these promises, and these are all found in His Word. And if you don't know about these promises, take the time to read God's Word. Read the Bible and discover these things, because the treasure is what we already have. We have our greatest hope in Christ. We have eternal life. We know the outcome of this battle. We have assurance. You know, that's what it means to have a life of faith, to have assurance, to trust. You know, what can stop you? What can overcome you? Neither life nor death. It says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. 
but we also have this guarantee in life that things are going to get worse. You know, 2 Timothy 3 tells us that in the end days, things are going to be terrible. You know, things might be great now, but if you look at the flow of history and the way things are going, things are going to get more difficult. And in culture and society, we're going to be more confused. You know, this is all the work of Satan. But you must remember at those times, don't despair. Don't give up. Don't fear. Don't run away. So many times God says this in the Bible. Do not worry. Do not fear. Truly be led by God's Spirit. <coughs> Just to close, you know, before Joshua, you know, before they go and set out to enter into Canaan, you know, he knew that he was going to be walking into a dangerous situation, walking into a lion's den. You know, they were going to face all these battles, all these wars that they were going to face. But what he held on to was God's word. He held out of God's covenant of the promised land. And what did God say to him? It says, in Joshua 1 9, my favorite verse actually, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that is our greatest blessing. When the whole world seems to be crushing down around us, trying to destroy us from every side, when we face persecution, from our family, from our friends. When the culture says one thing, and we're following God's word in opposition to that, and we're persecuted because of it, I want you to remember this. You are not alone. Do not worry. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. God is with you. He has a plan for your life. And our greatest hope is in Christ Jesus. So firmly hold on to that covenant. Let's take this moment and pray together.